uh, and separate and isolated nation. So he, it was decided that he should not go, and I criticize that in the L.A. Times article that you see. Criticize it sharply, because there is no one who's talked more eloquently, I think, about the issue than Colin Powell in his book, An American Journey, uh, where he really reveals his transcending of race and how important that was. So I criticize the United States for not going. I criticize them for not sending Colin Powell. And I also criticize what I thought was really at the heart of the United States' position to not go to the World Conference. In my view, the United States did not want to be confronted in an international tribunal uh, on an equal footing with 160 nations with the issue of reparations for slavery. That issue was hovering over this conference long before it started, throughout the entire conference, and to the end. The United States publicly said that the reason that they would not go, which was a defensible reason, was because of the criticism of Israel uh, and the claims, which I agree were illegitimate, the illegitimate claims uh, equating Zionism with racism, that they were, and we are, friends of Israel. We were not going to go to a conference where Israel was going to be attacked, and there's going to be a move to equate Zionism with racism. Uh, and they sort of quietly talked about the fact of reparations, but they didn't really acknowledge that that was a fundamental aspect of their not going. Well, what did they miss by not going? Uh, it was an amazing conference. There were, first of all, hundreds of organizations representing non-governmental organizations. And it was quite fascinating as you were there day by day. The NGO conference was the first week, and then the uh, United Nations conference the second week. To be there and watch the rallies every day, uh, there would be uh, hundreds of people in a rally and then people in the rally in a counter rally, and then a counter rally to the counter rally, and then a counter rally to the counter rally to the counter rally. <laughs> because there was no consensus about issues. If there was someone talking about the protection uh, of the uh, interest of uh, Palestinians in Israel, uh, an important issue, there was someone else talking about the treatment of Palestinian women uh, worldwide. Uh, and then there would be someone else talking about the treatment of people who are women who were in slavery, who didn't have the same opportunities as the women from Palestine. And so when you'd be marching in a group, you'd have to figure out who are you for and who are you are against. It was complete chaos in one respect, but it was an expression, and the greatest expression I've ever seen, of First Amendment principles. People from all over the world were chanting. And what was amazing is that we had translators there. The people were translated, chanting in different languages, and some of those who were chanting didn't realize that they were chanting with people who were saying things directly in opposition to what they were saying. <laughs> it was a phenomenal gathering in, in that respect. It was also typical of most conferences when uh, you have such a large gathering that everybody wanted to be heard. Uh, and the more you represent an organization, the more you were considered uh, uh, an elitist, an imperialist, a sellout. Uh, and uh, the people who thought they were most successful, I'm from nowhere, I represent nobody, uh, I have nothing to say, uh, and I should be the person given the opportunity to do that. <laughs> but there was an amazing agenda that was there, and I'm just going to briefly go over uh, the agenda, some of the, the interesting issues. One was the issue of slave, slavery in the slave trade. Uh, another was the issue of reparations. There was another issue about anti-Semitism, and anti-Semitism, be clear, it was not limited anti-Semitism against Jews, but against Arabs as well, but anti-Semitism in its broadest context. Issues involving Asians and Asian descendants. Uh, caste and discrimination based on occupation and descent. Uh, people with disabilities. Issue of uh, education from formal education to non-formal education, etc. Uh, issues of uh, public awareness, environmental racism was one of the topics, ethnic and national minorities and their representation, issues of gender inequality, uh, the risk and dangers of globalization, hate crimes, uh, issues of health, including HIV uh, and AIDS, the important role of indigenous peoples throughout uh, the world, uh, as well as issues of racism and labor and the relationship between the state uh, and workers. 
There was also issues of documented and undocumented migrants, migrant workers, refugees, asylum seekers, stateless, displaced persons, and members of their families. So you get a sense of the broad representations. Issues of the Palestinian cause, uh, issues of religious intolerance, uh, issues and debates about the Roma people and how they have been treated, uh, sexual orientation, and trafficking in women and children were among some of the issues were discussed in the NGLs and the National Conference. So a very broad agenda. And in that conference, uh, serious debate on all those issues. The United States pulled out uh, for two reasons uh, that later became public. One was the issue of the treatment of uh, Zionism, Zionism as racism. And the second was the issue of reparations for slavery. And their public stance was that we are not going to participate because those issues are not legitimate issues to be debated and discussed at the national forum. Let me take the first issue about Zionism as racism. It is interesting, it is true that in early reports and early drafts of the report, the NGOs had, I think, some bombastic language uh, associating Zionism with racism uh, and uh, represent a very minority point of view but they had it written down on paper. Some of the things that were in the, the document were absolutely outrageous. Let me read some of them to you. Uh, one of the points in the original document said, to also call for the reinstitution of UN Resolution 3379, determining the practices of Zionism as racist practices which propagate the racial domination of one group over another through the implementation of all measures designed to drive out other indigenous groups, including through colonial expansionism in the occupied Palestinian territories. Now what this means in, in trying to, when it says to reinstitute, that the world had already decided that the issue of Zionism and racism had been resolved. And here was an effort to bring it back into the debate, but it did not succeed. Those of you who follow this, it did not succeed. There was another, even more troubling aspect of this by a small group uh, of, of, of radicals at the conference who tried to not only raise the issue of Zionism and racism, but interestingly enough, asked South Africa, South Africa of all nations, to be the leading nation to challenge Israel on its treatment of the Palestinians. It says, call upon the international community to impose a policy of complete and total isolation of Israel as an apartheid state uh, in the, uh, as in the case of South Africa, which means the imposition of mandatory and com comprehensive sanctions and embargoes and the full secession of all links between all states and Israel, and later on in the document actually called upon uh, South Africa as the nation to monitor it. That was part of the inflammatory language. And of course the press picked up on this language uh, even though all of this never surfaced and never made itself into anything close to the drafts that were adopted by the conference. So there was debate about it. There was another amazing development that, that occurred uh, at the World Conference. I'm going to say a little word about that before going to some of the other details. Uh, Reverend Jesse Jackson was there, uh, and th there are few press opportunities that Reverend Jackson is prepared to pass upon. I love him to death. I'm not saying that to be critical. I'm just trying to be factual. Uh, and he was there for most of the week, and, and he found me and sort of embraced me as his legal counsel for the week that we were together, which created some interesting and, and trying times. The first thing he did, though, is that he sat down with Yasser Arafat and his advisors early on in the conference and I thought I brought it with me, but perhaps I didn't. And Yasser Arafat actually wrote uh, uh, and, and agreed to a very strong statement that never quite received all of the uh, public attention that it deserves, uh, uh, that was not at all hostile toward, uh, I do have it, uh, Israel. It was remarkably, uh, remarkably, uh, reflective uh, in ways that I had never heard it expressed before. 